Good morning. morning. All right, let's get something straight about the chili (laughs) cook-off. Last year, I did win. It was. It was a good job. And I deserved it. And the reason I deserved it is because the secret ingredient in my chili, four ribeye steaks. How many of you know I deserved it? (laughs) This year I'm working on a brand new secret ingredient, and so I expect expect to win this year too. Anyway, man, I am so glad to see you here, and I know that um, there are a lot of people that are out today, but we don't have too many empty chairs. If you're watching online, welcome to Family Church. If you're back in Unplugged, welcome to Family Church. If you're in the main room, welcome to Family Church. And man, I, uh, I'm excited about what God has already done in this place. I'm excited about what God is going to continue to do in this place. Aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. So good. So good. Just a couple of things before we get into the message this morning. Had a crazy busy week, rolled in uh, on Friday, went to Atlanta for a few days, uh, saw uh, some great things happen, made some great connections, uh, had some doors of opportunity open, so I'm super excited about that, but I feel a little jet lagged this morning, so please just give me some grace today as we move through the teaching, but um, I am so glad to be here, and I know that... that um, you know, that we're going to experience life change today, uh, and we already have. Just a couple of um, pieces of information that I want to make you aware of. This week, we haven't said a lot about it, but Karen is having a surgery this week on her liver, and so we're going to be going to St. Louis on Tuesday night and checking in there, and then she'll, she'll have a surgery on Wednesday morning, about a five-hour surgery, and she's going to be in the hospital for close to a week, so I'll be staying there in St. Louis, um, so uh, pray for her, pray, pray that, um, that this, uh, what the doctors are, are going to do goes smoothly, and, and they're telling us that it will, and we believe that. And so say, say a prayer for her this week as you... Um, as you have your quiet time with the Lord, and, and we know that, um, you know, that, that God has all things, uh, he works all things together for good, even sometimes a surprise su- surgery that you weren't counting on and don't want to do, uh, he does work all things together for good, so please continue to, to pray for her. All right, well, I have, uh, I've been asked by several people, how come um, on the week that Lebanon plays Camdenton, I'm wearing purple? And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put it out there. You know, Jesus. <laughs> Here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jesus, Jesus said, you know, love your enemies. And you know, I can't help it that I'm more spiritual than most of you. <clears throat> so I'm just, I'm just loving my enemies today. That's what I'm doing. All right, if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. If you're joining us for the first time, I'm, I'm in a series right now that I'm calling The Real Life, Real, R-E-E-L. We started last Sunday, and we are really just going to kind of pick up where we left off. Jesus had a way of reeling people into the plan and purposes of God. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that Jesus reeled me in. How about you? I am so thankful that Jesus reeled me in. Last week, we went through all the things that might have happened in your life had Jesus not reeled you in. And I'm, I'm grateful today that Jesus reeled me in. Jesus had a way of reeling people into God's plan and into God's purpose And he was also always reeling people away from the stuff that led them to a place of death. And he was leading them away from that so that they could be in a solid, doable relationship with him. And today we're going to talk about that real life, that real life relationship that Jesus wants to have with you. Because make no mistake, Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. Jesus made a lot of incredible statements 
And in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus made a statement that I think that we partially understand. John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, number one, Jesus said, I am, I am the way. And one time the disciples said to him, we don't know how to get to heaven. And Jesus said to that disciple, I am the way. I am the way. So we understand that. Jesus also said in John 14, 6, I am the truth. Jesus said the word is truth. So when you read the word, um, you're really reading the thoughts of Jesus. And we know that, that obviously that is truth. But Jesus made one more statement about himself in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and, and I am the life. And that's what we're going to concentrate on this morning, that last part of that verse. He knew, Jesus knew, that anything that we do apart from him is going to take us to a place of death. Listen, it's your relationship with Jesus that keeps you alive. It's your relationship with him that brings anything that's living to you. And so when we separate ourselves from him or we do something apart from him, then obviously it's going to create a problem for you and for him. And we're going to talk all about that this morning. Now, in, um, in fishing, you don't want to be reeled in because being reeled in leads to death. It leads to the frying pan, right? Whenever you're fishing. But when Jesus reels you in, you, you find a place of life that you simply cannot get anywhere else. And man, I hope to paint that picture for you this morning. And so my goal today is, is really simple. It's the same goal that I talked to you about last week. Number one, I want to reel you into Jesus. I want you to know him. I want you to love him. I want you to serve him. I want you to catch a fresh vision of who he is. I want you to see him in a brand new light. And number two, I want to help you learn how to reel other people into this life-altering, significant relationship with Jesus. And so we're going to talk um, a whole lot about that. But first, let me give you a quick recap of last week. Last week, we talked about two things. Number one, we talked about church should be transformational, not just informational. And we learned that, transform that transformational churches go out of their way to make Jesus famous. That transformational churches focus more on Jesus than they do personalities, programs, and individual ministries. That's the first thing that we learned. And secondly, we learned that transformation requires complete surrender. And I told you how that I'm no longer free to live my life however I see fit. As a follower of Jesus, he must be allowed to live his life through me. Now that means that I get to keep my personality, but he demands that I develop his character. How many of you were here for part of that last week? Okay, now today we're going to pick up right there where we left off last week and we're going to go right back in. I have to surrender to Jesus for this relationship to work. And you know, over the years, I've been, I've been a lead pastor for over 25 years um, in ministry for over 31 years. And I have met a lot of Christians who come to me and they say, Larry, you know what? I, I see this relationship with God working for everybody else, but it's just not working for me. And you know what it goes back to? One word, and that's surrender. That's surrender. When your relationship with God is not working, there's a part of your life that you haven't yet surrendered to him. And it's not, you know, it's not hard to find that, really. It's not hard to put your finger on that if you're honest with yourself about what your life looks like. And so for this to work, I have got to surrender my life completely to him. You know what that means? That means that I'm going to have to be willing to die to some things. This may shock you, but I don't always want to do the right thing. Anybody else honest out there? Okay. Like, I don't always, I don't always want to do the right thing. And so for this thing to work, I've got to be willing to die to some things. And, you know, let me tell you something about Jesus in case you don't already know. He will only ask you to die to the things that he knows will eventually hurt or destroy you. 
That's it. He's not asking me to die to anything that he knows is going to be a blessing to me or lead me into a place of abundance or lead me into something better in my life. He's never going to ask me to die to the things that he wants to bless me with, but he will ask me to die to something if he knows that it's going to hurt me or it's going to destroy me. And so here's how this works. When Jesus sees you in something or he sees you about to go into something that has no life in it, because he is the life, he will immediately try to reel you away from it. And at that point, you have a choice to make. So let's just say, you know, Jesus sees me going into something that has no life. And part of what it, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so part of his personality, part of his, um, one of his characteristics as the life is he wants to reel me away from anything that he knows is going to drain the life out of me. And so he'll start reeling. He'll start cranking that reel. And at that point, I have a choice. Now, in the church, we call this conviction. Conviction is when the Holy Spirit, which by the way is the Spirit of Jesus, and I'm going to teach you that uh, when we do a series on the book of Acts later this year. But when, when, when the Spirit of Jesus begins to reel you back from the edge of the cliff, you, you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make, and he will help you make that choice because he wants to keep you in everything that leads to you experiencing life. And he wants to keep you away from everything that leads you to experiencing death or hurt or destruction. You follow me? He loves you that much. He just does. He loves you that much. Now, I have, I have um, several weeks of information that I'm trying to get through. Uh, so just stick with me today because I really want you to dig into your relationship with Jesus. Number one, here we go. Number one today, the first point is this. God didn't just send us a savior. He sent us a relationship. God didn't just send us a savior. He sent us a relationship. We're going to spend our time this morning talking about how Jesus interacted with the people that were around him. And we're also going to talk about the example that he left for us to follow. In the Old Testament... God sent a manuscript called the Ten Commandments. In the New Testament, God sent a man called Jesus. Wow, that's a powerful truth. The manuscript that God sent in the Old Testament was written in stone by the finger of God. We call this the Ten Commandments, right? Maybe you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments. Maybe you have a picture of what they might have looked like in your Bible. Basically, they were two slabs of rock that, that God took his finger and he, he wrote the commandments on those two slabs of rock. And then he gave those slabs of rock to Moses so that Moses could take the commandments down and introduced those commandments to the people. So the manuscript was written in stone by the finger of God, but it wasn't very personal. So I have this, I have this rock here with me this morning, and I can tell you this, I would not be very excited about being in a relationship with a rock that told me what to do. Now, now ladies, I didn't say a relationship with the rock. <laughs> Some of you are like, I would, I'll sign up for that. <laughs> no, I didn't say a relationship with the, with the rock. I, listen, I would not be very excited about being in a relationship with a rock that told me what to do. And when you think about it like that, you read the Old Testament and you it's no surprise that they did some of the dumb things that they did. Doesn't that just seem really intimate and really, you know, just, you, you want to be, be in a relationship with a rock that told you what to do? It doesn't seem very exciting to me to be in that kind of relationship. But the man however, was personable, relatable, approachable, and very relational. 
So in the Old Testament, God sent the manuscript, but in the New Testament, God sent the man. And by the way, um, Jesus isn't just a rock that tells me what to do. He is a man who showed me how to live. So those Old Testament people, they got a rock that told them what to do. But in the New Testament, God sent a man that showed us how to live. Isn't that better? See, I can do that. I, I, I couldn't be in a relationship with a rock that told me what to do. But I could be in a relationship with someone that loved me enough to show me how to live. That's, that's the difference that Jesus makes. And by the way, Jesus is also described as a rock. I made a list of a few things that I could think of. In the scripture, he's the rock of ages, the chief cornerstone, the stone that the builders rejected. Uh, in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were dying of thirst, God provided a rock from which water flowed. Later, the apostle Paul would go on to tell us that that rock was Christ. Listen, we have a rock of rules that was replaced by the rock of relationship. See, that's, that's how he reels us in. That's why I'm excited about being in a relationship with him. That's why when he sees me going into something that's going to lead to death or destruction and he starts reeling on me, that's why I'm happy to, re to be reeled back to him. Because if I just had this rock telling me what to do, then I might not be too excited about being reeled back away from that. But now I have a man, I have a relationship that, that is constantly reeling on me. Now, let's, let's take this a little bit further. Here's what I saw in my mind when, when God was showing me all this. Go ahead and put up that next slide. So we have, uh, we have a savior minus relationship equals a dictatorship. And that's how come people fall away from church and they fall away from God. Um, they go to church because their grandma wants them to go. They have a relationship with their grandma, but they have no relationship with Jesus. So they come to church and they feel like, oh, they're just all about rules and they want to tell me what to do. And, you know, how many of you know you've heard that story? Yeah, some of you have been saying that and you need to stop. Um, listen, so a savior minus relationship equals a dictatorship, but a savior plus relationship equals what? It's a friendship. See, I don't want to be in a relationship with a dictator, but I would love to be in a relationship with someone who's my friend, right? So if I have a relationship with him, then that changes everything. Listen, God doesn't change. It's our relationship or lack of that determines how we see Jesus. So let's, let's bring the point back, back here. Um, my friends don't have any problems reeling me in to whatever they're doing. In fact, the deeper the relationship, the farther I'm willing to go and the more I'm willing to sacrifice for that person. If I love someone, they know it, okay? I have a hard time keeping that under wraps. So if you're my friend, guess what? I'm going to make you work to get rid of me. <laughs> it's true. It's like, that Larry, I wish he'd just go away. <laughs> no, nope. right, James? Yeah. I've, made, I've, made James <laughs> I've made James work to try to get rid of me, and I just won't go. Thank God. Yeah. My friends have no problems reeling me into what are their, what, whatever it is that they're doing. However, get, get this. If I don't have a relationship with you and you just tell me what to do all the time, I'm probably going to get sick of you real fast. So just for fun, let's look at how important this relationship thing really is. So go up the next slide. So think about it like this. A marriage minus relationship is a dictatorship. You get this? Now, a marriage plus relationship is what? It's a friendship. 
So you see, without the relationship, you're just, without, on the top line, you're in relationship with the rock that we, shot, that we had earlier, right? A rock. It's just a dictatorship. Now go and put up the next slide. Look at this one. Parenting minus relationship is what? A dictatorship. But parenting plus relationship is what? It's friendship. So what is, what is the common denominator in, in all of that? You got to have the relationship. See, you, you tell your kids what to do, but you don't have a relationship with your kids. They're, they're not going to see you as someone that they want to listen to. And you're going to be frustrated and so will they. And so the common, the common denominator in all of this, we have three examples that we just put up. And the common denominator in all of this is whether or not a relationship exists. And so this real life that we're talking about in this series is all, it's really all comes down to one thing. And that one thing is this, what kind of relationship do you have with Jesus? Now, that's, that's super important. That's super important. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Um, I, I can't move on just yet. I said something a few weeks ago that has stuck with me like glue. And I, I can't get rid of it. And so I developed it a little bit more. And I want, to, I want to share some of these thoughts with you this morning. After all the reasons that we've given Jesus to turn away from us, the reason that we can be in a relationship with him is because he is for us. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? So this is so awesome because, you know, the reason I can be, don't miss this, the reason I can be in relationship with Jesus is because he is for me. And the reason that you can be in relationship with Jesus is because he is for you. What's that mean? That means you cannot be in a relationship with someone that you're against. And, and you might say, oh, you know, Larry, I'm not against them. I'm just not speaking to them right now. I'm not against them. I'm just not going to treat them the way that I treat the people that I like. You may not feel like you're against them, but that certainly doesn't sound like you are for them. And again, you can't be in a relationship with someone you're against. Now, stick with me. Watch this. When you sin against God and you come to him, he will forgive you. Because he is for you and not against you. God isn't looking for an excuse to turn his back on you. He isn't keeping a list of your offenses in his back pocket. That's not who he is. Listen, you will never be more like Jesus than when someone sins against you, but you refuse to be against them. You will never be more like Jesus than in that moment. There's not a relationship on earth that can be saved until you decide that you are for them and not against them. And I'm not talking about abusive or destructive relationships. Don't misunderstand. I'm talking about relationships that can and should be salvaged. And so the question is this, how do we do it? You say, well, I, you know, I don't want to be against them. Or maybe you do, I don't know. So if you don't want to be against them and you know that you have some work that you need to do inside of yourself so that you can get to a better place, how does, how does it all come together? Well, I'm, I'm so glad you asked. How do we do this? Listen, one of the reasons that I'm so reeled into Jesus is because once he becomes our primary relationship, we do better in all of our other relationships. You know, I've said this many times, you know, sometimes back when I was practicing counselor, people would come to me for marriage counseling and, you know, the wife would be saved or, and the husband would be lost or vice versa. And, and, I would, and I would say to them, listen, listen, you know, your husband, 
he doesn't even know how to be in relationship with you because he is not in relationship with God. And so I'm not sure what I can do for you. I can put some band-aids on it, but I can't fix it. So all of my relationships become better once I have a relationship with him. And I'll tell you something else that, I, that I've seen too. Usually how my relationships are going has a lot to do with how my relationship with God is going. And so if all the relationships in my life are falling apart and no, nothing is coming together, sometimes I can go back and I can look at my relationship with God and see that my relationship with God needs some help too. So once he becomes my primary relationship, all my other relationships do better. Now, Jesus teaches us two valuable lessons about relationships that I want to share with you this morning. First, number one, Jesus teaches us, number one, how to make allowance for the faults of others. Jesus teaches us how to make allowance for the faults of others. What's that mean? That means I can't be in relationship with you if I expect you to behave perfectly all the time. I can't. When Jesus was reeling in the disciples, he knew what he was getting. And when Jesus was reeling you in, guess what? He knew what he was getting. He didn't expect his disciples to, to be perfect. He didn't expect them to be with, without fault. Look at this verse, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now look at verse 13. He says, make allowance. Look at this. Make allowance for each other's faults. Listen. How come we have stopped doing this? Don't look at me that way. Make allowance for each other's faults. Look what it says. He says, and forgive. See, you, you, can't, you can't forgive if you don't first make allowance for their faults. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. He says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Man, I wish that wasn't in there. But it is. <laughs> and he goes on and he says, above all, Clothe yourself with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. Again, he's talking about relationships. He says, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Um, verse 13, make allowance for each other's faults. The word allowance in the Greek actually means bearing up or supporting. And let's bring that back. Uh, to our relationship with Jesus. Jesus supports me even on the days when I need him to forgive me. And my question to you is this, have you stopped supporting the people that you need to forgive? Well, that's not very Christ-like. Don't look at me that way. I'm not supporting them. You'll, you'll never be able to forgive them. Until you can make allowance for their faults, you're never gonna be able to forgive them. Aren't you grateful that Jesus made allowance for your faults? Are any, is anybody here faultless besides maybe Mike Flanders? You know? <laughs> yeah? Okay. No, Jesus. Let's, let's ask Lindsay about that, okay? <laughs> Come on. Jesus made allowance for your faults. You have to make allowance for the faults of others. That's the first thing that he teaches us. Number one, Secondly, Jesus teaches us this. Jesus teaches us how to prefer one another. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. The word preference in that verse means to put a high price on. It means a treasure. It means a ransom paid. And I love this. I wish I had more time to talk about it this morning, but I can tell you that Jesus prefers us over himself. How do we know this? Because he paid the highest price for us. He paid our ransom. I can forgive you when I prefer you over myself. And until I prefer you over myself, I can't forgive you. 
Oh, come on, guys. I'm preaching way better than you're letting on this morning. (laughs) See, you can always spot someone who prefers themselves over others. You know how you spot them? They hold grudges. That's how you know. They hold grudges. That's how you know they prefer themselves and how they feel and what they have a right to keep a hold of because of how they were treated. You can always spot someone who prefers themselves over others because they hold grudges. Imagine Jesus getting ready to be crucified and all of a sudden he's thinking about you and he's like, I'm not paying, I'm not paying the price for that person. I know what they've done. I know everything they're going to do from birth to death. I don't know about your life, but I can tell you in my life, if anyone had the right to hold a grudge against me, it'd be Jesus. And so it just amazes me. We don't want people, we don't want Jesus holding grudges against us, but we want to hold grudges against other people. Some of you are like, I should have stayed home today. You know, (laughs) it's a better day to stay home. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I, it, it's painful. I get it. it. It hurts me too. <laughs> One time the Apostle Paul said, am I now your enemy because I tell you the truth? Well, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so, so listen, Jesus, teach, Jesus, my relationship with Jesus has taught me to make allowance for the faults of others. My relationship with Jesus has taught me to prefer others over myself. And that's why I can be in good, healthy relationships. And so I'm just, I'm just putting this out there. Maybe you need to, if you have a relationship that's kind of going sideways in your life, whatever, maybe you could look at those two standards and, and see how well you're doing. And if you're not doing so well, maybe you could make some adjustments. Okay. All right, let's, let's keep going here. How many of you know this relationship thing is really important? Yeah, it's super important. <clears throat> As you read the Gospels, <clears throat> the personality of Jesus begins to emerge. The Gospels present this man with such charisma that people will sit three days straight without food just to hear his words. Some of you right now are like, if he don't finish in five minutes, I'm going to eat. <laughs> I, I, I hope to do a good job bringing this out this morning. I was trying to think of, of you know, some clever ways to, you know, to present this to you, but I, I didn't really come up with anything new. But But here's the deal. That's not the Jesus that most people know, especially, you know, sometimes you watch Jesus on TV and how he's portrayed, or, you know, you go into churches and there's there's like crucified Jesus is all over the place. So Jesus is sometimes represented as kind of being dry. Uh, He's kind of stoic, you know, uh, kind of uh, just this religious guy that's kind of out there that's unapproachable or people see him as as being just this dead guy on a cross but as you read the gospels Jesus had passionate relationships and I'm not talking about dating relationships Jesus had passionate relationships you see Jesus having sudden sympathy for a person who had leprosy you see Jesus getting excited over the success of his disciples. You see Jesus having a blast of anger um, at at the cold-hearted Pharisees. You see Jesus grieving over a friend who who died way too soon. Listen, Jesus' relationships were not sterile. They were not sterile. Jesus quickly established intimacy with the people that he met. Now, the people of his day, they kind of kept rabbis or they kind of kept the holy men at a distance. But Jesus drew out a hunger so deep that people crowded around him because they just wanted to touch his clothes. Now, I can understand that if Jesus is wearing this jacket. (laughs) Okay. 
Maybe I deserved it. I don't know. But how many of you know Jesus was exciting to be around? You know, I've said this so many times. You know, children um, crowded around Jesus not because they wanted a lesson in homiletics. They crowded around him because he was awesome. He was awesome. I mean, he just, he would show up and people would come and they they wouldn't eat for three days and they would be be like, you know what? I just want to be around this guy. I just want to be where this guy's at. And it was very counter to that culture for that to happen, especially um, in, in in that time in our history. Jesus had a way of reeling you in. No public figure in history ever had a more diverse list of friends. Jesus was friends with rich people, Roman centurions, tax collectors, prostitutes, leprosy victims, smelly fishermen, Ivy League up-and-comers, doctors, farmers, bird watchers, housewives, divorcees. Jesus was friends with everybody. In fact, I think that Romans chapter 12 and verse 16 out of the message translation, really describes how Jesus lived. Romans 12 and verse 16 says, get along with each other, don't be stuck up, make friends with nobodies, don't be the great somebody. Man, I love that. It's so good. That's, I, I think that's how Jesus lived his life. He lived his life through relationships. If Jesus was anything, he was relational. He was a campfire discipler. People were drawn to him and nearly everyone around him changed. You could stroll right up to him without fear of being rejected. Isn't that awesome? I wanted to read just real quick. This is, this is actually, this is day 55. Uh, this is, um, this is, he calls me friend. It's my men's devotional. And and I wrote a devotion several years ago for this book that I felt like really, um, really uh, fit with what I was trying to communicate here. And the title of the devotion is Just a Touch. And I'm going to try to skip through some of it. But it's the scripture is Matthew chapter 9 and verse 20. And the scripture is talking about the woman who had the issue of blood. And she had that for 12 years. And she, she, she came up... Um, thinking to herself, if I can only put a finger on his robe, I will get well. You know that story? And Jesus said to her, um, you know, Jesus caught her trying to touch him. And he turned around and he, said, and he says, uh, you took a risk of faith and now you're well. And it says the woman was well from that moment on. Isn't that an awesome story? But this is, I'm just going to read it just, just like I wrote it. Several years ago, I attended a professional basketball game in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm not a huge basketball fan. But the Los Angeles Lakers were in town, and in those days, Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal were dominating their opposition. I mean, no, that's been a few days ago. But that was cool, though, to see those guys um, playing at the pyramid there. Um, So a group of guys from my church and I went to see them play. They did not disappoint. As we headed out of the arena after the game, I looked to my left, and I could not believe my eyes. Standing there in the lobby was a very famous pastor I had often watched on television. I bet you thought I was going to say Shaq and Kobe. I loved this man. To me, this was, just so you can kind of get, this was like the late, or this was like the mid-90s. Because I'm not going to call this guy out, but you're probably going to figure out who he is in a minute. This was like the mid-90s. Um, I love this man. To me, there was no one better in ministry. I thought to myself, if I can shake his hand, my day will be made. I, got, I have got to try to meet him. I slipped through the crowd and made my approach. But before I could get to within 20 feet of him, a large group of men, or should that be a group of large men, cut me off. What are you doing? The big one in the front asked. I just wanted to meet the pastor and shake his hand, I replied. No one touches Bishop. (laughs) Another spouted. You don't understand. This is this is me trying to be like, please, sir, let me touch you. Okay, it's like, (laughs) I'm like, I'm like, you don't understand. I'm a pastor too. I just wanted to thank him for his excellent ministry. Like we said, you can't touch him. The wall of muscle didn't move. 
I left there that night more disappointed than I had been in a long time. I wasn't disappointed in the fact that I didn't get to touch one of my role models. I was more upset that he felt too important to be touched. On the drive home, I remember praying, Lord, if that's what successful ministry looks like, then I don't want to be successful. Jesus was approachable. You could walk right up to him without being harassed by church bouncers. <laughs> the woman with the issue of blood found healing the day she braved the crowds and placed her finger on the hem of his robe. And man, I'm so thankful that Jesus is approachable, relatable. <laughs> Aren't you? And I'm closing, I'm closing with this. Jesus reeled you in because he communicated God's word through um, relationships. And that's what he still does. So, all right, let's stand. And I'm going to ask the musicians to go ahead and come back this morning. And we're going we're gonna to have a prayer here. All right, let's pray. Lord, today we are so thankful that Jesus reels us in and reels us away from anything that might be leading to death as the life that's his that's his one of his functions as the life one of his functions is to keep me away from death and so when he sees me moving towards something that is hurtful or destructive when he sees me moving towards something that would create death for me Jesus just invades that and if you're here this morning and that's you. Listen to me just for a minute. Jesus isn't trying to keep something from you. He's trying to protect you so that something doesn't happen to you. And I know that you may not feel that way right now. You may not feel that way right now. You know, you may feel like, oh, they're just trying to keep this from me. I deserve this. You know, listen, that's not what this is about. And just listen to me for a minute. If you're here today and you, you the, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus has been convicting you. He's been trying to pull you back away from something and maybe away from someone. Um, you, have, you have in one ear, you know, you have your, your, your flesh that's telling you all these things that feel good and that you want to hear. But in the other ear, you hear God, you hear the voice of God. It's still whispering. You haven't turned that voice off yet. And he's saying to you, this is not good. This is not going to go well for you. This is going to end in a big mushroom cloud of destruction. And I love you. Listen, listen guys, don't turn that voice off. Don't, don't do it. Make up your mind right now, this morning, in this place, that, that Jesus, he only knows how to reel you into what is going to lead you to a place of life. And, and if he sees you, you know, on the edge of that cliff, he's going to put that hook in and he's going to start, he's going to start that gentle tug, but he, he won't make you come back. You have to do that on your own. And I'm just, I'm just going to let you know this morning, if you've been, if you've been struggling with that, you know what? God loves you. And he brought you here to tell you that. And, and now whatever you do with that, that's, that's going to be, the ball is going to be in your court. But you know, Jesus will only lead you to a place of life. So if he's tugging on you, you need to listen. You need to listen. And maybe this morning, maybe you're here and, you know, we talked a lot about relationships today. And, and I, I said, you can't be in relationship with someone that you're against. And I, I talked about how that you have to make allowance for the faults of others. And I talked about how that you have to prefer others over yourself, because if you don't, you're going to be a grudge holder. And you know what? That's hard, man, that, that's hard to hear. That's tough. But I'm telling you, Jesus is trying to lead you into a place of life. And that's the path. That is the path. And he'll help you do that. So I want to just say a quick, quick prayer over those two groups today before we, before we uh, wrap this all up. Lord, today, first of all, I pray, Lord, for that person or maybe persons, maybe someone watching online right now, that um, they're, on, they're on a path that is taking them to some place not worth going. 
but they don't see that right now. Right now, they see that as their escape. They see that as something good. But we know, Lord, that, well, that your word even says that those things like that are like mirages. They're out there. We think, we think we're heading into something that's real and something that's going to sustain us and, and really, you know, make our life good. And yet, and yet we know that uh, in the back of our, 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 our hearts, we hear that gentle whisper, that, that spirit of Jesus telling us that's not the way to go. That's not the right path. You, you need to turn around because you're heading to a place of destruction. Lord, wh- whoever, Lord, whoever I'm, I'm speaking to today, God, give them the strength to be able to say, you know what? That's truth. I recognize that as a truth. That is my truth that God is speaking to me. Lord, give them the strength today to make those changes. Lord, to, to get off the, the death path and get back on the life path. And we, Lord, as you know, we pray that nearly every day around here as a staff, that people would be off the death path and on the life path. And so, Lord, pull people off of that path. Jesus talked about it. He said, it's wide, it's destructive. Many are on it. He said, the, the, the other path is narrow, it's straight. Few find it. So Lord, take them off of that death path and put them on that life path and give them the power to do it. So I pray that. And then Lord, secondly, I pray today, God, for those who are experiencing relationship dysfunction. And Lord, I pray that you would um, give them, first of all, give them the desire that they might not even have right now to to begin to make those changes that they need to make. I know when relationships break down, we're always pointing our finger out at that other person and saying, well, they would just do this or they would just do that. But Lord, help us to look inside today to see what we need to do. Um, Romans chapter 12, as much as depends upon you, live at peace with all men. And so help us to do what depends upon us um, because we know that that's the path to peace. So I just pray God for relationships, whether it's friendships, whether it's marriage, um, whether it's parenting, whether it's a family dynamic, um, whether it's something at work, whether it's a church relationship. Lord, I just pray that all that stuff comes together in a good way. And we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want the prayer team to come this morning. I'm going to give one last altar call before we, before we pray. You know, um, as I said earlier, Jesus is, is always reeling us. He's reeling us away from um, anything that leads to death and destruction, reeling us into him. And, and if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, maybe, maybe you're that person that I was talking to earlier. You've been around church for a while and you kind of see church more as a dictatorship, not really as a friendship. You see Jesus more as the Old Testament rock that tells you what to do instead of the New Testament man who shows you how to live. And that's been frustrating to you. And so today, if you don't know Jesus, if you have never asked Jesus to come into your heart and forgive you of your sins, but you know that today the Holy Spirit is reeling on you and you feel that inside, you know there's something kicking around inside of you saying, hey, you need, you, need to, you need to go to the front of that building. You need to give your life to Jesus. You need to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and you need to live um, a, a different way. And if you're here today and that's you, I wanna invite you right now to just come on up. Don't stand there, don't wait. Grab the hand of the person next to you and they will come with you, I promise. But if you don't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, then you just get up here right now. We, we do altar calls a little bit different here at Family Church. And, and it's no, no, no heads bowed, no, no eyes closed. It's like, okay, a straightforward march. If you mean it, we want you to mean it, okay? So if you don't know Jesus, then you can come at any time and you can know him. And if you just need prayer for anything whatsoever, um, we would love to pray with you and for you this morning. And if not, um, we just want you to worship with us today as we, uh, as we wrap up.